Kelly Kincaid. Kelly Kincaid. It's First Aid with Kelly Kincaid on Sway in the Morning. As we do this every week, uh, Kelly Kincaid is here. Uh, though she is not a certified doctor, she is somebody who does research and cares about your um, your, your life, the quality of your life, health, mind, and body. And um, Kelly, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Sway. Good morning, citizens. How is everyone doing on this last day of May? The last day of May, and as you said earlier, this is the last day of mental health, health awareness. awareness month absolutely you yeah. know a lot of people want to say mental illness and you know this has been almost 40 years that we've been uh, honoring mental awareness mental health and so today as we close out mental health awareness month i wanted to bring in someone very special uh, a scientist way who has been studying all around the world kind of just to tie everything up because all this month we've had people such as victorious da costa with his film mm-hmm. uh with weldon Earth. Irvine, and we also had the First Lady of New York City, Shirlane McRae, mm-hmm. and the doctor who was talking about uh, the black men uniting and talking about mental health. So I wanted to introduce our scientist, Shaquille, Sh- Shatil Kaur. How are you this morning? I'm good. How are you? Shethel. Shethel. Shethel Kaur. Like lethal. Yeah. Shethel Kaur. Yeah. Oh, like- yes. Now, I got to tell a story. Shethel. So y- yes. y- yesterday, we just met Shethel Kaur. And um, who's a scientist who studied abroad in India, different places. And um, and we just happened to be walking by an espresso shop, the best espresso shop here in Manhattan, Midtown, Frisson Espresso. Uh, and we met a young man by the name of Tulian, who's one of the owners of Frisson Espresso on 47th Street. If you ever get a chance, okay. go by there. I'll go. And he stopped me and said hi. And he was so cool, young man. I want to support his business. And uh, so I went into his espresso shop, and um, I even posted it on my Instagram stories. And then, um, and and then the scientist walked in. She yes. thought, like, wait a minute, Sway, what are you doing here? And I was like, well, <laughs> what are you doing here? I'm getting a latte. And I was like, I'm getting a latte. And then we started talking, and you revealed to us about some of your work. And that you were a scientist, and you were uh, you just finished studying in India, and you've also studied in Thailand, in the Czech Republic, uh, and even in the States. And I, I said, wow, uh, I wanted to close out this month on first day with mental mental health awareness. Uh, what about your studies? And as, as we continue to talk, I said, keep it. You need to come up to the show mm-hmm. to talk to the citizens. And here we are, Sway. Divine timing. Divine timing. So you've studied on all these different places. What, what are some of the similarities and some of the challenges that people face with mental health awareness in different countries abroad and compared to here in the United States? Well, I think the biggest issue is stigma. So there's still a big stigma talking about um, addiction, which I mainly focus in and specialized in, and mental health issues. There's still um, that barrier about talking about uh, mental health issues, making it aware. So it's really great to have something like Mental Health Awareness Month to really bring awareness to the issue, to get the dialogue flowing, to get kids talking to their parents about um, issues they're having in school. Um, and actually, the American Psychiatric Association recommends that kids, you start talking to your kids as early as nine years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and not really in the sense that don't do drugs or don't do this, but um, make it more practical. Say, you know, you saw your uncle get wasted at that wedding last weekend. What did you think about that? How did that make you feel? Did you enjoy that behavior? Mm-hmm. Would you like your, Would you like to see yourself be like that? So... Opening the dialogue up, breaking the stigma, breaking the barriers around these really taboo topics is really important. In your studies, um, you know, in the United States, even with hip hop, we've had uh, artists just like Little Uzi Vert, Logic, Kit Cudi, and even Kanye, who've talked about their dealings with mental health. What if, in your studies, the kids in India and in Thailand, in your studies, who do they have to look up to? Because When these stars and even people in the NBA, um, they've just started making a big initiative. They have these Kevin Durant people to look up to overseas. Who are these kids reaching out to to get help? Well, unfortunately, westernization is uh, heavily influencing the Eastern cultures as well. Um, So a lot of times they are looking up to people like Kanye and other rappers and um, people like Avicii that are doing these sorts of drugs and because um, of westernization McDonald's and Starbucks and all these kind of different businesses coming in um, they are modeling their behavior after that so there is a huge especially in my um, my home state in Punjab um, not really because of the western the westernization but also um, there's a huge drug problem because of the 
of the area of where Afghanistan and Pakistan is. So there's mm-hmm. lots of drugs coming in. And the politicians are using that to gain votes. And How do use they use that, the drug coming in, opioids coming in? How do they use that to gain vo- votes? Um, it's They use a theme, so it's not really opioids there, but they uh-huh. basically are giving... So a lot of people, kids, especially male youth especially, are... Um, basically free they're not really doing much work because the other cheaper labor is coming in and doing their work for them so they're sitting around free um and these drugs are kind of thrown into their lap uh-huh. um so the accessible ability is is really high about getting drug and i think almost 75 percent of male youth are addicted in the state of punjab which is a huge public health mm. crisis and before even doing making any public health interventions they've made a bollywood movie about it so you can kind of see what's actually happening happening on the ground and how entertainment is kind of running parallel with that. Hmm. Shito Kaur is here, who's uh, a scientist. What is your official title? I have many titles. Okay. I wear many hats like you. So I'm a okay. global mental health scholar, scholar. I'm a human rights activist. I'm a yoga and tennis teacher. I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner. I'm also a scientist. So uh-huh. I don't just fit in one box. Okay. <laughs> mental health issues. Help us understand, like, uh, in some cases, are they genetic they can be genetic. Uh-huh. Um, they can also be environmental. So their mental health can be, you know, influenced by if if you're in a ba- bad environment, they can uh-huh. be kind of the software that deals with your thoughts, feelings, emotions, or they can be more the hardware that deals with your genetic or your biological makeup. Uh-huh. But they're not. It's not really truly one or the other. So it's kind of a mi- mix of nature and nurture. And, and so the causes, especially in youth, you you find are as we go back to what I said originally, it's, it's the causes are pretty much similar. Yeah. Like it's environment, you know, it could come from environment, it could come from a, a bad home environment, it could, you know, come from bad influences. That happens all over the world the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Definitely. The risk factors are various. I mean, one of the biggest risk factors is social support. If there's um, a kid that's not connected, I mean, as humans, we innately want to bond and connect. Mm-hmm. And if we're not getting that bond and connection from our peers or society due to maybe um, we've been traumatized or we've been victimized, then we're going to try to seek something else that we can connect to, whether it's a phone, whether it's food, whether it's sex, whether it's drugs. That's going to way we're going to find a way to bond and connect. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really a factor of disconnection mm-hmm. um, is, is what you're looking at with a lot of these issues that youth are dealing with. What if a person is on, on drugs or opio, opiates, opioids and um, they feel that they are connecting are they in denial that this isn't is it translating to like a mental illness well yeah i would say this is an unhealthy connection because um if you overdo an opioid um if you overdo opioids and you can die so in the u.s right now there's been almost sixty four thousand deaths of opioid overdose um sorry mm. sixty four thousand drug overdose and mm. 40 thousand of those were opioids and because um mm. Drugs, uh, doctors are prescribing these at a really high rate. Eighty percent of people um, are starting their addiction from the doctor's prescription. Wow! So, so uh, well, let's talk about the pharmaceutical industry and yeah. why is this still taking place? And we have these stats right in our face. I mean, why is that? Well, it's a it's a huge structural difference. I mean, I mean, a huge even human rights violation. Yeah, the pharmaceutical industries um, are benefiting so much, yet there's no really rehab set up. Mm-hmm. If you think about rehab, you think of like the rich kid, the rich white kid who's and they're going to pay 70,000 to 100,000. dollars um, now that's not really right because mm-hmm. this is affecting so much. This is affecting rural kids, this is mm-hmm. affecting suburban moms as well and mm-hmm. which they can afford those rehabs. But community the ba- the care should be community based. It should mm-hmm. be accessible. It should be affordable because you can recover. You can heal from this if you have that opportunity and that service available to you. Okay. Sheetho Kaur is here. Um, first day with Kelly Kincaid. We're talking about Mental Health Awareness Month. This is the last day, but we're going to continue the conversation throughout the year. Um, if you're affected by mental health issues, 888-742-3345. If you have a friend or a family member you want to ask questions, hopefully she can help you out. Give us a call. Sway in the morning. Shay 45. Yes, Sway in the morning, uh, Kelly Kincaid. We have a special guest here. Yes, we have Sheetho Kaur here. Mm-hmm. She's a, a research scientist, among many things. And we're, today we're talking about mental health awareness. Today is the last day of mental health awareness. We've been talking about it all month. And we've really had a great conversation just to start with you, um, just talking about just your studies uh, of research globally in the United States and also overseas in India and the Czech. I found it so interesting 
interesting that you said about the uh, drug addictions and the suicide rates. There were sixty thousand or eighty thousand deaths. Right. There's there's sixty four thousand deaths um, due to drug overdose in the U.S. last year. Forty thousand more were due to opioids. Those are the prescription pills so that 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 are being given by right. doctors. Yeah, doctors, but also it's um, kids who have friends that have doctors that have access to it. So uh-huh. it's sometimes it's kids selling their kids pills back or just giving it to their friends and dispersing it out. It's not all the time just because of doctors, but yeah, because yeah. you got the black market, the illegal uh, trade as well. That's right. Yeah, where, where they're stepping on those drugs, so you're not really getting what you think you're getting anyway. Um, how can people reach you directly? Because we got a lot of callers on the line, and if they want to reach you directly, um, how could they? Yeah, so you can reach me by email. My email is shitalkandola at gmail.com. That's S H E T A L K A N D O L A at gmail.com. Do it again slower. Go ahead. That's shitalkandola, S H E E T A L K A N. D O L A at gmail dot com. We have Todd on the line from Sacramento. Good morning, Todd. Good morning, Sway. How are you doing today? Doing well. Woke up breathing, Todd. I got that advantage. <laughs> That's <what's up. laughs> yeah, I've been listening to you guys for a long time. And Sway, I wanted to uh thank you for acknowledging veterans. Um I hear you periodically talk about the uh the veterans and, and how we get help and stuff. So Absolutely. I'm a vet and I've and I've been um you know, I've been struggling with a bunch of stuff for a while, but uh, the thing I wanted to say was, um, you know, I went a long time without getting help. Um, I got out of the Gulf War in the 90s, and, you know, I just struggled for like 15 years banging in the walls. And then uh, one day somebody told me, you need to go to the VA and, and get checked out. And, and I walked into the VA, and my life been changed forever. So, you know, there's help out there, and it's not a toe tag. If you, you know, got some kind of mental illness going on, you know, just go talk to somebody because, you know, it could change your life and you can just, you know, you don't have to struggle like that anymore. A lot of folks are scared of that stigma um, and, and scared to kind of take that first step. Just for those who have never taken that first step, Todd, can you give them an idea of how they greet you? Like, what is the first thing you do when you go seek help, for you at least? Well, well, I had a, a cousin who was a Vietnam vet, and, um, you know, he was a combat vet, and uh, he kind of explained to me, he said, a lot of the things that you've been going through with drug addiction, with relationship issues, with, with just all these things that, that happen from being in combat, um, they just kind of start catching up with you. So he told me, look, he said, just go to the VA, just tell them what's going on, and, and then they'll take it from there. So I started, you know, getting into therapy. I started digging in deep, just trying to figure out what was going on because what I was doing wasn't working. You know, I kept running in the walls. I kept busting on myself. And it was like, you know what, I'm just going to do this because what I was doing is not working. Mm-hmm. And that's what kind of got me started. Todd, thank you for sharing your story, man. I appreciate you. You're a citizen of Sway in the morning, okay? Congratulations on, I appreciate it. on getting help, too. And you know, he talked about addiction. Um, and she thought we were talking about um, in your studies with addiction and incarceration. What is the tie on that? Um, yeah, so there's a big tie with, um, I think, mental health, addiction, and incarceration, um, especially in the U.S. You know, the U.S. is um, only 5% of the global population, but 25% of the prison population. And within that, um, if in prisons, 40% of those are black males. So there's a huge human rights violation. There's a huge unbalance that's going on right now. Um, and because of the war on drugs that Nixon initiated in the 60s, there's been lots of arrests due to um, nonviolent drug-related crimes, which has overcrowded our prisons, um, which has put unnecessary people people in jail, Mm -hmm. um, which is why the U.S. would be beneficial to move towards a model of decriminalization. Um, If you look, for example, at at Switzerland in the 1980s, they had a huge heroin ec- epidemic. Um, so they had high rates of HIV, high rates of crime. So in order to to fix this, they opened up a harm reduction center and they gave free needles, they gave clean needles, beds, showers, heroin for people to come in and inject. Um, and this, after they did this, they saw HIV decrease, they saw um, deaths decrease, they saw crime decrease. Mm-hmm. So this was a, an example of a really good model of how to not penalize someone who's using drugs and already in a really bad state, but giving them an opportunity to grow, having harm reduction as opposed to hardline policies. Mm-hmm. Wow. Sheetho Core is here. We got um, TC on the line from North Carolina. Go ahead, TC. Good morning. Hey, good morning, people. I'm a good longtime morning. listener, five-time caller, first time getting through. 
um, Heather B, Tracy G, uh, Sway, definitely in the morning. I want to say big up. Thank you. Um, real quick, man, um, I, I believe my son is suffering from depression. He's 13 years old. He he comes home from school. He goes like he he eats. He t- uh, he take he goes to sleep pretty much, and he wakes up and then it's like you know he'll get ready for the night and then go to bed again. He he's not that outgoing of a of a person. Neither neither was I. Neither um, at his age. Um, his sister is pretty much the direct opposite. She's seventeen, um, but I I believe he may be suffering from depression. Just not saying anything. Uh, real quick, I suffered from it um, some years ago. I, I, I reached like an all-time low, and it really took my brother coming to me saying, hey, man, you, you're just not yourself. I, I don't know what's going on with you, but you're just not yourself. And after reflecting for about 10 to 15 minutes, I went back to him with tears in my eyes, man, because I, I knew he was right, but I didn't know what was going on. So from that point on, I you know, I would I, I talked to somebody. It wasn't nobody professional, but just the older heads, you know, the OGs of the neighborhood or whatever. And I kind of, I changed my perception. Uh-huh. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? It, yeah. it, it, it really was instead of the glass half full um, or half empty, it was, it was half full. So I just did that pretty much uh-huh. um, every day. You know what I'm saying? And just changed my perspective on life in general and always saw the good. TC, thank you for that. Let me ask you about, um, because sometimes the kids uh, or the children may not feel like they could talk to their parents immediately. What kind of school-based interventions are there or could we set up uh, for pe- kids who are still in grade school and might be suffering from some type of mental health issue? Right. So the school is a great place to educate and to intervene and to even screen for children that are dealing with um, mental issues. Let's be honest. I mean, high school, middle Mm -hmm. school, these are tough times. And even life in general, it gets pretty rough. So if we're taught from a young age how to deal with difficult emotions, how to deal with difficult life problems in schools, um, that can be done through mindfulness training. That can be done through meditation, group meditation. Um, That can be done through social emotional learning Mm -hmm. in which we're able to learn how to identify our emotions and communicate them effectively as opposed to get angry or lash out. Um, but, you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. You know, so it's not only the school that has to be there, the teachers have to be there, the parents, if it would be beneficial if they were involved. Uh-huh. Um, but it really takes a group effort to really get the kid on their feet, to give them the best, uh-huh. most positive, successful environment to succeed. Well, what advice would you give TC? TC, you still there? Yes, sir. About his 13-year-old son. Um, Without being, I guess, too preachy, I I think um, be gentle with yourself and be gentle with him. Um, 13 is a really precocious age. Um, He's probably going through a lot of hormonal changes, um, a lot of things at school. So I would try to stay away from trying to diagnose him and label him. Um, But if you do feel it's getting serious, I would take him to a doctor to get screened. Um, But, you know, sitting down and talking with him and relating with him, I think this is the most effective way you can start to understand him and his needs and also relate your experience to helping him. TC, thank you for your call, man. You're a citizen of Sway in the morning, bro. Uh, I'm going to take another caller, uh, Tony in Las Vegas. Go ahead, Tony. Hey, Tony. Yeah, I wanted to say... With the rehab facilities, I went to Betty Ford through the Affordable Care Act. And the first thing they do is they drug you up and knock you out. And the success to failure rate is 20% success, 80% failure. Mm. So, I mean, it's pretty much a money scheme. Mm -hmm. You you agree with that? Because they, they, they do not help you. And what they tell you, like parents or spouses, is to not trust the person, all they do is lie about everything, and they don't. And you, as the addict, aren't in the room while they're tell, telling your parent this. Hmm. Wow. And so it's, it's just so. It's like kick them out. They're, anything that comes out of their mouth is a lie. And when I first, I don't got to Betty Ford. I just there's a situation where he called me out, a counselor called me out as a liar. So right off the bat, it's like, it's combative, you know? Yeah. Tony, thanks for sharing that. And you agree yeah. with them. Like, how do you know, well, how do you select 
where to go for See, rehab if, if this is happening. Yeah, that's the problem. So there's actually no federally mandated rehabilitation centers um, that use evidence-based care. Mm -hmm. So anyone can really open... A rehabilitation center as long as you have money and connections um, and like I said they're usually crazy expensive so I would recommend if anyone's really seeking healing and therapy to travel east um, go stay in ashrams in India but what talk, if you, you can't afford to do that yeah, like, what uh, if you can't afford to do that which is yeah. why the system is broken yeah. which is why we need more community based care okay. so in India I was training lay health workers uh -huh. people that are high school graduate to deliver intervention, physical detox, and relapse prevention therapy at their homes. And uh -huh. this can be done in the U.S. Uh -huh. You can get a psychiatrist, you can get a psychologist to task shift and to train them to deliver these interventions at really low cost, um, use technology to keep in touch, to monitor, to supervise. Um, but And, and ap academics know this, people yeah. in my field know this, but people in the addiction field um Beside from addiction specialist, board certified, which I would recommend, that's the first place you should go if you're having addiction problems. Go to a board certified addiction specialist. Do not go to rehab first. Okay. All right. Hey, Tony, man, I, I wish you the best, man. And stay. System also, yep. No, I've been sober now for 15 years. My but man, Tony. Our Congratulations. System, our system is, should not be built by private corporations. Mm -hmm. And President Obama. Right before he left office, he executive ordered so it wouldn't be allowed anymore. And then Jeff Sessions, our current attorney general, went and got changed it. Why are Nike? Why is Nike building prisons? Because it's our new slave labor. Mm. Tony, thank you, man. You're a citizen of Sway in the morning, um, and that's some thoughts of you know how politics play a role in this. Um, it's, it's an issue. Let me ask you, too, about how how are we learning now? How is research being done? Is it lab animals or or, or, or is it being done on humans? Like, you know, let's talk about lab mice. And um, So, yeah, there's actually a really great study that has to do with lab mice and addiction. Mm -hmm. So you put a rat, a rat in a cage, you give them water, and you give them water laced with heroin or coke. Uh -huh. um, now, when they're alone in a cage, they're going to most likely drink the laced, laced water and drink it until they die. Um, now you put Bruce Alexander initiated, um, he's a psychologist in the 1980s. He initiated, okay, let's make a rat park, which is basically like rat heaven. Let's give the rat balls, let's give the rat toys, let's give the rat friends, let's give the rat people to socialize with. So he put the bottle of water with, without, um, heroin and then he gave the the bottle of water with heroin and when they had the rat park when they had the rat heaven they almost never went to the lace water mm -hmm. so it, i mean then you think okay this only happens in rats but then if you look at the the vietnam war um 20 of the army of the veterans were addicted to drugs yeah and america was scared like we're gonna have zombies coming back to our, our country but when they came back um Almost 90% of them recovered because they had their family, they had their friends. But in Vietnam, they had nothing else to do. They yeah. were alone, they were scared, they were in a jungle. So when they came back, they recovered from that addiction and they were able to deal with you know, other traumas that they had to, they had to face in, yeah. in the war. So wow. this is a good example of, I guess, of addiction in, in, in the research field. She the core, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Uh, I, I want to give out that email again real slow. Uh, you know, it's uh, Sh Sheree is on the line from Wisconsin, Matt in Newcastle. Dante in Pittsburgh, Chris in Pennsylvania, Kendra in Indiana. I want y'all to email her directly. Go ahead. Yeah, so my email is Sheetal Condola. That's S H E E T A L K A N D O L A at gmail.com. One more time. I just like how you, you know. You say, it's so. Sheetal Condola. <laughs> I like S -H -E -E how you spell. S H E E T A L K A N. D O L A <laughs> at gmail dot com. Yeah, this conversation is uh, I would love for you to come back one day because the more you talk about it, it's like this broken cycle that I don't see how it's going to get fixed, because if we fix it, all the pharmaceuticals, the addiction uh, counselors and camps, they'll be gone. And then it'll be healthy people. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> it'll be a people utopia, just like those rats. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody be drinking the tainted water. Uh, Sheetho, thank you for sharing this thank information. You. you have to thank come you back. Well me. done. Thank you.
Thank uh, you so coming up a little later. Uh, oh, also, if you want to reach Kelly Kincaid, you can. You can follow me on K, uh, K- Kelly Kincaid, K E L L Y K I N K A I D. And we'll be posting this interview on Sway's Universe, the YouTube channel. But you can listen back to it right now. Uh, obviously, you have SiriusXM. Go to SiriusXM.com forward slash on demand. And just in a few minutes, we're going to have Chloe and Hallie, uh, Beyonce's new group. They're going to be joining us to talk about their new project, Sway in the Morning. <laughs> 